His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for we'll never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. I mentioned on an episode recently that the story The Culp Spiring is like a history written in invisible ink. Historians keep finding new details emerging from the records, and on today's episode, we're taking that to a whole nother level. We're going straight through with this one, so no outro music on the other end. Just one long conversation as we uncover and recover the story of a remarkable woman, someone who was hiding in plain sight the whole time, neglected and obscured by some, but remembered and brought back to life by today's very special guest. My name is Claire Bellergeau. And I'm the founder of Remember Less, a nonprofit with the mission to tell the story of an amazing enslaved Black woman who lived on Long Island during the founding era. I love the title of, of the foundation and the book because it's sort of a command, right? It's an exhortation to remember her, which is, I think, appropriate. Yeah, we wanted to give people uh, an actionable idea. And I will also mention you spent some time as director of education at Raynham Hall. That, Correct. Yes, I was the uh, staff historian and also the director of education there. So since that's a, a prominent part of the story, do you want to, if, if we just walked into Raynham Hall while you're there, do you want to just give us the brief intro of, you know, give us a foundation for the story? And, and maybe would you have said anything about Liss when, when you first started at Raynham Hall? Actually, there were two different times that I worked at Raynham Hall. And the first time, was 18 years ago. And that's when I actually first discovered Liss in documents. I had uh, started working there first because I wanted to do an audio tour of the museum. And I had a company that was doing professional museum audio tour recordings. So that's how I got introduced at Raynham Hall to the staff. And then I became working as a tour guide there on the weekends. And so they bought at auction 18 years ago an amazing artifact that's really the sort of inciting incident to discovering Liss's story. They bought a Bible from Swan Galleries in New York City. This was a Bible that had been passed down through generations of the Townsend family, and this descendant put it up for sale. And um, it wasn't expensive because of the verses inside. It was valuable because it had the names of enslaved people written in the marginalia of the end papers. So this was a revelation to Raynham Hall that there had been enslaved people there because actually the family had been misidentified for many decades as Quakers, when in fact they were not. They turned out to be Baptists. And so I guess by saying they were Quakers, people thought they didn't enslave black people. But this Bible was clear proof that they had and so 18 years ago, when they bought that Bible, I asked the staff if I could do an exhibit on slavery in Oyster Bay, which I did. And in the course of putting together that exhibit, I found these amazing letters that weren't at that site. They were out in the Hamptons at the East Hampton Libraries collection that began me on my journey to discover what had happened to this amazing woman. No, it's amazing just in that story, you know, we'll come back to this theme of assumptions made about history and uh, the attempts to correct them. So can you just give us some background? We mentioned the Townsend family who were the owners of, of Raynham Hall. Can you tell us what position they held by, the, say, around the start of the revolution? Sure. Uh, they were a very uh, patriot-leaning family. The father, Samuel Townsend, was a member of the New York Provincial Congress starting in 1775. And he was a wealthy shipping merchant. He had a fleet of five large transatlantic sailing vessels, which he was uh, operating in partnership with his brother, Jacob, who lived right next door to him there in Oyster Bay. And actually, Liss was enslaved with Samuel 
and his brother James Townsend, who was a physician living in nearby Jericho. And so these two brothers, James and Samuel, had inherited from their father a 50% ownership of Lys and also her sister Hannah. And so, you know, these wealthy Townsends were also very political. Uh, Samuel was the town clerk, town justice of the peace. After the war, he was a New York State senator, reelected five times, and his son Robert is now famous as Washington's lead spy in Manhattan in the Culper spy ring, operating under the code name Culper Jr. That wasn't something that he made known in his own lifetime, but since about 1920, that's been something that, that we've known and what the family has really become famous for. Right, and we will definitely get to the Culper connection, but in terms of Liss and her early years there, and maybe by extension, the the state of slavery in New York, which I think will be new to a lot of people, do you want to say a little bit about, I think she was born in 1760? 1763 is an estimated birth year. There's actually no record of her birth. Uh, And like many people who were enslaved, Often there were no records, not only of a person's birth, but a person could be born into slavery and live their entire lives and die and never have anything written down about their life, no records at all. And so many of the records that we do have are inventories or in wills or runaway slave ads. But the story of slavery in the North has really been covered up in many ways. When we teach children in school about American slavery, it's almost exclusively taught about something that happened during the Civil War in the South. But of course, slavery was happening here in New York since the very first year that New York City began. New York City began as New Amsterdam in 1626. And that year, 11 enslaved Africans were brought in by the Dutch. And it continued up through the British when it became New York. And actually, the British established chattel slavery, which meant that when an enslaved woman had a baby, that child was enslaved at its first breath by her enslaver, and that enslavement continued for their entire life. And so, in the end, New York had more slavery in Lys's lifetime than any other northern colony. So any colony north of Maryland, New York by far had the most, about four times as much as Pennsylvania and more than all of New England combined. And for the Townsends, do you have a sense of, I think you write, or I've seen they had about 20 slaves, I guess, different points in time, but... Yeah, I found records of 20 distinct individuals, which doesn't mean that that's the total number. And and like you mentioned, and, and you know, what was eye-opening to me, the intricacies of it. So like you're saying, you could own shares in a, in a slave, in enslaved person, which is horrible, but so they might be lent out or, or it seems like a very shifting definition or hard to count, like you said, invisible population. But what, what, in general, do you, what would you say the Townsends were, were using the their enslaved people for? Like, did they have a, fields that they were growing or what kind of industry? It turns out that even though Raynham Hall right now has a very small um, bit of property around the existing building, uh, the Townsends in Liss's lifetime owned quite a large parcel of property there in Oyster Bay that led all the way down to the harbor uh, through what's now the downtown, up a few blocks in the other direction. And then they also had purchased large tracts of land outside of Oyster Bay so that when you totaled the acreage, it was about 350 acres of land. And they were um, growing all sorts of crops on their land for sale through their merchant trade. They also had a lot of livestock that they were uh, cultivating. And he had his large shipping business, too. So he had warehouses down by Oyster Bay, and he had the whole shipbuilding business and the crews of the boats. So enslaved people certainly were inside the house uh, working as domestic laborers, agricultural laborers in the field, and then skilled workers in his shipping business as well. In, in terms of their ages, so Robert was the son of, of Samuel Townsend, so he would have been growing up in the household. What was the difference of age between him and, and Liss? He was about 10 when she was born. So uh, he was their third son of eight children. So he really would have seen Liss um, working inside the household, probably taking her first steps, learning how to speak. Even small children 
who were enslaved were expected to do work. So their lives were full of hard work uh, from the very earliest days all the way through their life. And I, we're not necessarily following the chronology of how you discover things, because I know that you discover things at different points. So where's the next point where you have a document for knowing since her birth that she reappears or her presence in the record? You know, the, the notable moment when she really strongly appears is right at the middle of the Revolutionary War in May, May 18th of 1779, which is when she, with great bravery and courage, escaped. She escaped the towns and household with the help of a British commander named Colonel John Graves Simcoe, who commanded the Queen's Rangers. So he had been billeting in the towns and home throughout the winter of 78 into the spring of 79. And he actually was an interesting person for his belief that slavery was morally wrong. Uh, he helped Liss escape. And in my research, I found two other instances where he helped enslaved people escape. Uh, so he helped her escape. And the son who became Culper Jr., Robert, wrote to his father about that escape eight days later. And so that letter, which still exists, is in the collection at Raynham Hall which begs the listener to ask, if there is a letter about an enslaved woman escaping with Colonel Simcoe, why did they not know that there was slavery in this household all the way along, right? You know, interesting. And, and also uh, another assumption or, or wrong turn of history, I think, in, in the letter, Robert mentions Liss. And for a long time, is it true they assumed, historians assumed he was talking about a cow <laughs> that had escaped? I mean, this is the story, right? Did they truly believe that it was a cow? When the letter, when you read it, does not refer to an animal in any way. Um, the man who discovered in the 1920s and 30s that Robert was Culper Jr., a historian named Morton Pennypacker, he had full knowledge of the letters that I discovered that tell about Liss's really horrible turn of events, um, not to jump too far ahead for listeners, and it's clear in these letters that she's an enslaved black woman. And Morton Pennypacker, no doubt, had his eyes on those letters in the 1920s. So why did he not ever write about her? Why did that never come up in any of the stories and the legends that became so celebrated uh, across Long Island? And I think that we need to consider the fact that a lot of these stories became whitewashed that racism played a role in keeping these stories uh, literally invisible. No, and I think we'll, we'll come back to Morton a few times and lay some more things at his feet. But in, in terms of the time frame, so uh, Robert was working, if, if people know the the TV series Turn, which I'll also ask you about in a second. Oh, my gosh. He was, he was living in the city, so he would have seen, or I don't know if he actually he saw Simcoe coming back through with, with Liz. So I, I guess my general question is, if the Townsend family knew this, I think she was a teenager at this point, had left their homestead, did, did they make any attempt to get her back, or was how big of a... This is one of the most curious parts of the letter that we've been talking about, the letter that Robert wrote, which was in response to a letter his father had written to him that must have mentioned the escape. Uh, that earlier letter is no longer in existence that we know of. But in this letter, Robert says quite a few contradictory things. First of all, he mentions where the Queen's Rangers, this regiment that was commanded by Simcoe, a regiment of around 350 soldiers, where they are. Now, that in and of itself is mysterious because Simcoe had left with his regiment to go fight at the Battle of Stony and Verplanks Point on the Hudson. And this was a secret gathering of thousands of British troops that were trying to very... Um, stealthily approach these forts on the Hudson. And so how is it that Robert, who I believe was already an informant for Abraham Woodhull in the Culper Spiring, he, he clearly is following the regiment. He says specifically where they are. He says they are beyond Kingsbridge, which is the tip of Upper Manhattan. That was actually a physical bridge. And he actually says also, when I see any of the officers will make inquiry for Liss. So the first sentence about her 
says that he knows where she is, and he's going to approach these officers who he personally knows of the regiment. But then he switches gears almost immediately and, and advises his father, uh, though I think there's no probability of you getting her again, and says that his father should write off her value and consider her a dead loss as just another thing that the British had stolen from him. And so there's no reason to say, I know where she is and I'll talk to them about her. And then to say, but you'll never see her again. You shouldn't even attempt to try to get her back. Um, they never placed a runaway slave ad for her that I can find. And I found many others in that same time period, you know, referring to enslaved people on Long Island who had tried to escape. And then he solidly mentions Simcoe as the person who helped her escape and says that Simcoe certainly must have known it when they uh, left Oyster Bay. And, and it's curious. I, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving aside the image of Simcoe from the Turn series, which was totally out of character. Totally but inaccurate. Yeah. Would, would, do, you, do you find that odd that he snuck her out? Could, could he have just more blatantly just say, I'm, I'm taking this young woman with me or, or maybe even bought her if that was... Just the fact that they snuck her out which strikes me as a little interesting. Well, it was illegal. He was <laughs> okay. committing a crime when he did that. Well, they're the um, occupying force, though. I mean, how much would they have stopped? They are, <laughs> but you could still petition to have such a valuable possession returned to you. Um, he actually bought from Samuel Townsend in the days before he left two large, like, door hinges. They're called H hinges. And he bought just piles of nails. And so... He had three wagons in his company, and in my uh, imagination, I'm imagining him building like a little place for her to hide in there. Yeah, a secret compartment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why else would he buy hinges? I guess he could have been repairing something, but it doesn't seem uh, too logical that he would do that. So in, in terms of the time frame of occupied New York, and for those that know the Culper story, Townsend is writing notes that are picked up by Courier and taken back to Setauket. Um do you, do you know Liss's movements after she left Raynham Hall? Yes. I mean, they traveled uh, across to Manhattan and then all the way up the length of Manhattan and then over the last bridge into this encampment that the British had called Kingsbridge. And um, from Kingsbridge, the Queens Rangers did a, a few um, other movements in that general area before they moved up to Stony Point and participated in that battle. You know, uh, regiments had camp followers who were with them, women and civilians. And uh, I wonder, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if Liss and the other camp followers might have stayed back at Kingsbridge. I mean, they wouldn't have gone near the battle itself. But whatever happened in that time right after she escaped, uh, she made her way into Manhattan. And that connection isn't really known. Although I do know that she had met through Simcoe. John Andre, Major John Andre, the British spy master, right before she left Oyster Bay with Simcoe in March of that year, he had visited the Townsend home for several weeks, just on a vacation. And so Liz had gotten to know him. He was at the battle of Stony Point and had actually rode on his horse through the scene in like a victorious parade after the British victory there. And so he was headquartered in New York City. I don't know if Liss might have gone into New York City with him. I do know that she ended up there, enslaved by another British person whose name was never revealed. And I do know that Simcoe and his Queen's Rangers returned to Oyster Bay in August. So about three months after they left, they came back, obviously without Liss. And they stayed in Oyster Bay for a month at that time before they departed again. Which is another awkward, unknown situation, right? If he comes back to the the scene of the household and, and he's Samuel's gotten the letter saying that he took her. or Right. And, and, you know, Robert has said clearly to his father, don't even look for her. You'll never get her back. And then I was able to see in his own ledger books in the city that during the time when he was a spy, he bought her several things. So they did have contact during the war. And then at the end of the war, they had a lot of contact, which I have great evidence of. Yeah, and and so that we're getting back into the record. So she was you're, you're saying enslaved by a British officer, I, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds. But if she had, in a sense, escaped from Raynham Hall, could he have legally bought her? Like there would have been no no one to buy her from, in a sense. Or... Well, I mean, the Queen's Rangers could have uh, just gifted her 
to a British officer if they wanted to without a proper deed or title or anything like that. Which is horrible to talk this way, but it, it's, it plays into the story of the legality and, and some issues that come up later. It's very, very complicated to think about. It really is. And I think that um, there's at least a plausible scenario where Robert knew she was coming into the city. He had just then become the lead spy, Culper Jr. And so he was setting up his own network of informants right as Liz is entering Manhattan. He could have really used somebody like her Mm. who had a connection to the British um, military officers so that as he was operating as a spy, one of his tactics was to volunteer to stand guard outside of British headquarters at one Wall Street here in Manhattan, uh, one Broadway rather, here in Manhattan. He would put on a homemade red coat and volunteer to be a loyalist guard at the door. So if she was going into that door, into British headquarters, um, enslaved there by a British officer, they would have had a great opportunity to exchange information. Right. And, and given they had almost grown up to, you know, live together in a yeah. sense, they had that connection. I mean, another scenario is that Samuel was also knowing that he did not seek her because he was in full knowledge that she was going to aid Robert in this way. And, and he was a long standing patriot. Long standing, long standing. There is no uh, way to prove this. And that's part of the angst of studying the movements of people who are involved in espionage. You know, that they don't write things down <laughs> the way we would like them to. But, you know, one of the spies did, Abraham Woodhull, Culper Sr., out in Setauket, right as Liss is entering Manhattan and Robert is uh, lifted up to lead spy, he writes about a lady talking about her in code using the number 355. So he's saying that a woman, uh, he says, of his acquaintance, and he says who he'll see in the city, has a way of outwitting the British uh, that he finds exciting. I don't know if that's list, but I think she should be on the list because she could be invisible. She could walk through rooms and overhear things and not be noticed. And what's great about this, and you can talk more when you, we talk about the secondary material, but you can link to these letters and actually read what Abraham wrote about, you know, a, a woman that will help him. Or so you you can draw some of your own conclusions. It's, you know, it's tricky when you look at the you know the word choices and the antecedents and who's mm-hmm. who's the I he's talking about. But some some have deduced that it's um, Anna Strong. So there's there's definitely debate about three five five. I'd like to bring that up just briefly because um, Anna Strong was really the core of that show Turn, but there has been some recent research, uh, not my research, but another researcher who really did some interesting work, uh, Mark Sternberg. He discovered that Anna Strong's husband, Sela, was at home during the whole war and that the Strongs did not live in Setauket at that time. Uh, Their property was... Uh, more near Port Jefferson, I think. Yeah, Mount Misery. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, she was not signaling to Caleb Brewster and his whaleboat crew while they were out on the water with her laundry line. But through um, some records that he found of pensioner accounts, the crew would come onto Celia Strong's property and hide either in the woods or underneath their whaleboat and wait for Celia to give them the all clear signal. Now, they don't mention Anna giving an all clear signal with her laundry line, but it's not implausible to think that she would do that. So Anna Strong in his new research really is a helpful patriot wife, not a woman who is traveling or deeply involved in the culprit spy ring with drop boxes and things like that. Well, anyway, what's fascinating, I've, I've went out to East Hampton and, and spoke to the people who, you know, run the Penny Packer collection. It, there's so many myths and stories that are entangled in this history, and it's like this fine surgery to kind of pull apart the pieces. Yeah, I hope I hope we'll talk about the Gardner House out there in East Hampton. Yes, well, we're getting to that because I know there's a couple of twists that we're going to get to. What happened in the middle of the war, of course, is Benedict Arnold, America's worst traitor, decided he was going to uh, get in a deal with John Andre to hand over West Point Fort to the British to the tune of, you know, three million modern American dollars. 
that was his idea of what he was going to do. And it, it would have really hurt the Americans if that had happened. They, they would have gained control of the Hudson River. And so when Andre finally struck that monetary deal with Benedict Arnold, he was very close friends with John Grave Simcoe, this commander that had helped Liss escape. And he wanted to tell Simcoe about the plot. And so Simcoe had marched his men all the way through the Pine Barrens in August, you know, full packs, all the way out to East Hampton. And Sir Henry Clinton was also out in East Hampton. And then Andre, who was in Manhattan, zipped out there by boat for a special meeting to fill Simcoe in on the Benedict Arnold treason plot. And, you know, we know this through multiple documents, but there's also this handwritten account by John Lyon Gardner, who's remembering what he saw when he was a boy aged 10 years old. So he's a boy out in East Hampton at the Abraham Gardner house where the British are having this special meeting, Andre, Simcoe, and Clinton. And he tells us that two enslaved black women almost revealed the whole treason plot. Isn't that incredible? No, it is. They, they, yeah, and I think the story is that though they had passed through the room serving or, like you said, invisible presence. One enslaved woman who lived there, who may be a woman named Zell, I found a woman named Zell who was enslaved there. She's walking through the room where the men are meeting with a tray, and she overhears them talking. She tells another enslaved black woman who's only there for the meeting, a woman who's described as being very affectionate towards Simcoe, particularly. Now, remember, Liz had escaped with Simcoe the year before and maybe hadn't seen him for that whole year. Maybe Andre had brought her out there specifically because Simcoe was his friend and he knew that Simcoe had helped her. It's just a theory, but it's plausible. In any case, the second woman had a much more active role. She realized the importance of this intelligence, and she told the lady of the house, Mrs. Mary Gardner. Now, Mary Gardner was also a patriot. Her son was serving as a surgeon in Washington's army, and she already had a secret meeting planned with an American captain who was going to sneak into East Hampton to meet with her. And she had every opportunity then to pass this intelligence on, that an American general was going to give up an American fort to the British. But in the end, Mary Gardner just didn't do it. She didn't trust these women's word, and she didn't value them, really. She said that it was just foolish talk of these enslaved women. And so she didn't tell. And that always was remembered by the Gardner family so much that John Lyon Gardner wrote it in this pamphlet about Andre's execution when he was in his late 20s. No, it's an amazing story of how things get passed down. And this will bring Morton Pennypacker back in because there's an issue of how he transcribed those uh, notes. Not only a, a poor transcription on his part, but an out-and-out whitewashing theft of this story. He took this story, which he very well knew what it said, that had happened in East Hampton. And because he wanted to uplift the story of Robert Townsend as Culper Jr., he just relocated the whole story from East Hampton to Oyster Bay. And all good Long Islanders know the distance between those two points. Then, instead of saying that two enslaved black women overheard, he just took that completely away from those women and gave it to Robert's little sister, Sally, and said that Sally overheard Andre and Simcoe talking inside the Townsend's home, which is just impossible. They just weren't there. And there's lots of proof that shows that they were out in East Hampton. So that story then got blown up and became texts that children still read in school in Oyster Bay. A book called Trees and Stops at Oyster Bay is being taught in school to this day. Yeah, and I, I wanted to just make a brief aside back to Raynham Hall. And I know you don't speak for them, but there, I think there are some monuments or, or some plaques that repeat that story. Yes, right outside the, the building itself is a huge... Uh, right, that mentions Sally's connection to, to uncovering the plot. It says that information from here led to Andre's capture, which is certainly not true. Was there ever a discussion of changing that, or do you think... How do you go about correcting... Actually, there's a second marker that's even bigger that really names Sally particularly up at the Fort Hill Cemetery, which is where the Townsend family is buried, and where there are multiple markers of enslaved people being buried as well. So, I mean, do you think 
that sh- I, to me, I think that should be changed. And then I'm deeply offended that it hasn't been changed, especially because my student book, Remember List, is now going into hundreds of children's hands all across Long Island, all across New York City. And, you know, although Raynham Hall has done a good job of interpreting the lives of enslaved people there, uh, there's just no reason for those markers to still be there. And it's, it's an interesting corollary to the issue of statues of slaveholders in different parts. We all have heard or seen things. This is maybe a different spin on it, but it is information that needs to be corrected on a public monument. And so... I think that Liz is going to have statues of herself. I think she's going to have places that are named after her, like plazas and streets and squares. I think that Liz is going to have musicals written about her. Uh, I think she's going to be series on Netflix, even bigger than Turn ever was, because her story is true. Well, and it's it's still going. So we we've been out to out East Hampton, and whether that was her or not specifically, you know. You know what? She she can represent whoever it was. If it wasn't her. I understand that we can't prove that, but she she represents, and that's that's why I consider her to be a founding figure, not because she invented anything. I don't think we'll ever be able to prove if she was a spy or not, but because she represents 20% of the population who were enslaved Black people whose stories are not being told. And But what's great is the specifics of her story are compelling in their own right. And so as the British the British are leaving, she is owned by a British soldier, I think, at this point. And she could technically, I don't know if you would have thought that she would have gone with the British who had maybe somewhat more or were getting a little bit more enlightened about slavery. What they had done was they had promised in New York that enslaved black people who came over to the British side could have their freedom at the end of the war if they had supported the British effort. And Simcoe had no doubt told Liss about this offer because in the time frame when she escaped, right after that was when Sir Henry Clinton pronounced this idea. Thousands of African Americans, self-emancipated, came over to the British side, and then 3,000 African Americans went up to Nova Scotia and Canada on ships from New York. And so Liss was no doubt aware of this offer, but we don't know the circumstances of who enslaved her and their relationship. And she was three months pregnant at the time. So this is the fall of 1782. So she came to Robert, and this is enumerated in some letters about her. She came to him and asked him if he would repurchase her, and he agreed. I'm just going to let that settle in. <laughs> let, let's just like be so incredibly impressed with her agency. First of all, when she escaped back in 1779, that was a real risk. She could have been severely punished if she would have been caught. Uh, Every town in New York since 1730 was mandated to have a slave whipper that was paid by the town, also called a Negro whipper and a whipping post. And there's lots of evidence of enslaved Black people who tried to run away being branded, being collared and shackled. It, just horrific tortures that were done to people. And so Liz risked all that initially. And now she's giving up a chance at possible freedom in Canada because potentially she thinks that she'll have a better life under Robert uh, in his household. Because, you know, once she knew she was going to be a mother, now she has to think of her child, mm-hmm. you know, and no resources at all in Canada, um, no one up there who she can trust. Right, and she had a sister, right, at, who's still out in Oyster Bay? And a mother. Her mother's name was Pender. And uh, so we know that Hannah was still alive, and her mother might have still been alive as well. And so she she moves into, what is it, Robert and, and two of his cousins, these three men, three, three bachelors up by Peck Slip, and they have a... Right. <laughs> so he had had his his shop down in Hanover Square, more in the center of New York. But when Benedict Arnold came to town and started rounding up spies, Robert was so frightened that he was going to be caught up in that, that he had left town for three months. And when he came back, he moved his shop and his living uh, situation up to South Street Seaport area to Peck Slip. And that's where Liz moved in now. Um, And so I actually found the rental agreement with his landlady that was up in Mystic, Connecticut, which describes the shop below and the apartment above. 
And um, I see how he bought a plate and a glass and thread to make towels when she moved in. So he made her a little, some little personal amenities for her to have. And so she was not there to do hard labor. He had hired a white maid named Polly Banvard, who was their housekeeper. And so it was him, his little brother, William, and his cousin, John. And they actually called it Bachelor's Hall. Well, and, and I, I think you have evidence for this, that the child was biracial. Can you say that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's re- referred to in later uh, writings as being mulatto, which is a offensive term, but it means biracial. And, and there's no, I, I mean, we would just be speculating. There's no determining who the father was. There isn't. But I would say that Robert shows a great interest in her son, whose name was Harry. And um, he shows a great interest in Liz. And so it's certainly plausible that he's the father. Uh, could have also been her British enslaver or another white man. But she gives birth to Harry in February of 1783. Now, would, would you think at this point in the story, she can stay with Robert and they could build a, a found family there up in Peck Slip? Or, but that's not what happens. Well, Robert also exhibited signs of being against slavery, which was not typical for his family. Um, He seems to be the outlier of the Townsends that thought slavery was also morally wrong. And they had, uh, Liss and Robert had a mutual friend in a middle-aged woman named Anne Sharwin. She and her husband, Richard, had had a saddle shop in Hanover Square near where Robert's dry goods store was. And this woman, Anne, had just lost her husband. He died suddenly in his 40s. And Anne Sharwin, agreeable to Liss, had offered to buy both Liss and Harry. This is when the baby was about six months old. And it may be that Robert just did not want to own a slave. And so that was why it was agreeable to him. Or maybe they had had some sort of a parting of the ways. I don't know. But he agreed to let this woman buy Liss and the baby under this special verbal agreement. And the agreement was that they would never leave Manhattan or Liss would never be sold away to a place she didn't want to go to uh, without this woman coming back to Robert so that he could buy Liss and the baby back together. You know, enslaved women were under a constant threat that their children would be sold away from them and they might never see their children again. And so Robert's showing a lot of attention to this idea to be able to keep them together. And as far as he knew, this was the agreement that this woman would enslave Liss and Harry, but she would keep them together and come back to Robert if she ever wanted to resell them. You can see, I, I've, you know, I always liked Robert, Robert's story, but you can see his meticulousness. He's strateg- He's trying to plan for all contingencies. So he's he's trying his best, I guess, which is interesting in terms of how history keeps fighting against him in terms of this story. Well, his meticulousness now turned towards his business. So there's a lot of records of how he, during the period after Liss was sold to Anne Sharwin, he was seeking to recover bad debts from the, from the war. Uh, a lot of people went through serious economic reversals after the Revolutionary War. And he engaged a lot of lawyers and you see a lot of letter writing where he's trying to get his family's money that they're owed back from people. So his meticulousness really didn't serve Liss during this time because he wasn't watching over her in any way. He took his eye off it. Yeah. Okay. He really did take his eye off of her and Harry. And uh, this woman, Anne Sharwin, who was a widow, was only a widow for about a year. Uh, One year later, she met a widower, a wealthy man who sold uh, linens, mostly, uh, fabrics, Scottish man named Alexander Robertson. And uh, he was a very wealthy man living in lower Manhattan. And they got married on uh, Christmas Eve. And it did not go well. (laughs) They fought immediately. Uh, The marriage seems to have only lasted about a month He later did this again with another wife, where he only married another woman for like a month and then dissolved this other marriage. So this marriage was dissolved, but he retained ownership of Liss and baby Harry, who is now two. And then things went really badly for Liss, because out of spite or greed or both, he sold her south to Charleston, South Carolina, 
and he separated her from her baby and kept Harry in Manhattan. I can only imagine how devastated Liz was as she's now on a ship headed for Charleston, separated from her young son for the first time in her life, not knowing if she would ever see him again or who would be caring for him. It's just devastating to think about. And Robert had no idea. Yeah, how long did it take him to realize or did word get to him that that had happened? If you can believe it, two years. Oh, wow. Two years. And the man who enslaved her in Charleston, amazingly, was already known to history. Isn't that incredible? Alyssa's story is connected to so many narratives that we already know that it's really anchored in uh, the founding era in unique ways. So the man who enslaved her down in Charleston is pictured in the famous paintings of the Boston Massacre of 1770. So if you can try to bring up that image in your mind, in the center of these paintings, you'll see Crispus at Tux, the man of color who's dying uh, as the first casualty of the American Revolution. And then right next to Crispus, you'll see a man with a large club raised high in several different versions of the image of the account. And that man with the baseball bat, that's the man who enslaved Liss in Charleston. His name was Richard Palms. By the time he enslaved her in 1785, he was known as Captain Richard Palms. He had been a Continental Marine during the American Revolution. And he had actually also served as the personal bodyguard of John Adams, who would later become an American president. He had... um, personally accompanied Adams and his son as they traveled to Paris to, uh, quote unquote, help Benjamin Franklin negotiate with the French. So Palms was living down in Charleston at the time, and he is the one who enslaved Liss down there. And I don't know if you want to leave all, you know, any of this off, but it, Robert does become aware and eventually starts efforts to, to retrieve her from Palms. Yeah, you know, Liz's story is so important. I'm not going to withhold the ending to listeners because they really must read either Espionage and Enslavement in the Revolution, my book for adult readers, or uh, the new book for younger readers called Remember Liz. Both of these books were co-authored by Tiffany Yecky Brooks, who I've been collaborating with throughout the publishing process of this, uh, writing about Liz for people. And so what happened is Robert found out eventually And he interrogated that man who had sent Liz south, Alexander Robertson. And he actually stole Harry from the man. Harry was four at that time. Just took him out of the household and brought him to his parents' house in Oyster Bay. Of course, Harry could not be freed. No children were allowed to be freed by law. Uh, So Harry was re-enslaved with the other enslaved people at what's now Raynham Hall. And, and how amenable was Palms to giving up his... Not at all, <laughs> actually. Palms had had a long history of bankruptcy, also of uh, violence. He had been arrested for beating up a sheriff in a passion, as it said in the papers. Hmm. Uh, of course, in the Boston Massacre, he was very violent. And uh, he was a bit of a thug. But he also had financial problems throughout his life. So Robert, with the help of his older brother Solomon, uh, started engaging several people down in Charleston who they knew were also against slavery morally. Uh, The first couple of men that they asked to help were Quakers, and those two men actually refused to help because they wouldn't buy a slave even to help the person. But the second person that they wrote to, Adam Gilchrist, who was more of a family friend, said that he would help buy Liz back and bring her back to New York. But unfortunately, there were some roadblocks. First of all, Richard Palms had not fully paid for her. He had a mortgage on Liz, and that mortgage had to be settled before she could even be offered up for sale. He also just sort of um, arrogantly said he wouldn't sell her at any price. And there was a new law that had just passed in South Carolina that said that people who were in debt over war debts or other debts, could elongate the period of paying back the debt by three years. So Palms had at least three years to pay back the mortgage on Liz. And then up here in New York, Robert had actually joined an anti-slavery group called the New York Manumission Society. 
They actually had their first meeting in Manhattan the very same day that Liss entered Charleston Harbor aboard this ship that was bringing her to Palms. And so Robert's group, the Manumission Society, which was started by John Jay and had Alexander Hamilton in the group and a bunch of other interesting people, they didn't succeed in ending slavery by law in New York, but they did succeed during the time when Liss was down in Charleston with passing a law that made it illegal for a slave to cross over state lines back into New York. So while she was in Charleston, it became illegal for her to return. An incredible twist, but Robert owned a ship called the Betsy, and it was making regular trips back and forth, up and down the seaboard. And uh, I don't see the Betsy coming into New York Harbor, but I see it going into Boston uh, right around the time when I think she returned. So I think it's plausible to think that uh, she might have just come right into Oyster Bay Harbor with no paperwork at all and just been smuggled home. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, when, again, this was new or I hadn't thought of, of this aspect of it. But so she was sort of, in, and I think you write about it as a sort of in-between state or a limbo. So without papers, and could she be freed if she wasn't, there was no documentation of her? Yeah, this was a big problem for her. I mean, she she could not be freed by Robert because he had acted Ill- illegally bringing her back from Charleston. Um, you know, there were there's all these complications that you'll read about in, in the books about her, Remember Liss or Espionage and Enslavement, that made it complicated. But she did seem to be living in a state of quasi-freedom. Uh, I see her in 1789 listed in the Baptist Church of Oyster Bay's records of congregants, right across from Samuel Townsend, who owned half of her, uh, as Elizabeth, a black woman. And they don't notate her state of freedom in this record. But the other enslaved people who are still part of the Townsend household aren't also listed. So she seems to be set apart in that way. And then I see her in the 1790 census, the first federal census, not in Oyster Bay, but I believe I'm seeing Liss being called by her proper name, Elizabeth, in a Massapequa record as a free person working as a servant in Fort Neck House, which was this grand mansion owned by David Richard Floyd Jones. Uh, She's listed there as Free Elizabeth, if that is indeed her. And so what would it take for her to become really free, for her to get her legal freedom? So in that same year of the federal census, 1790, both the men who had inherited half of her died. Samuel Townsend in Oyster Bay died, and Dr. James Townsend in Jericho also died in that year. Maybe she was living in Massapequa to just not be in the area as these complicated estates are being uh, divvied up. Now, what made Dr. James Townsend's estate interesting was that he had seven adult children, but four of them died when he died. And so now Dr. James Townsend, his estate has three adult children that own parts of Liss and her sister Hannah. Robert controlled Samuel Townsend's estate And they don't seem to have had any hold on Liss or Hannah. But what about these three adults? I found at Hofstra University a document where one of them, Martha Townsend, is giving up what she describes as her certain proportion or right to Liss and Hannah and two other enslaved people. So she's saying in this document, I don't want to own them. I give up my part. That leaves two. And in 1803... I find the manumission certificate of Elizabeth and her sister Hannah called the Children of Pender being freed by those last two surviving heirs. So it was a long road for Liz, a long struggle for freedom, but she finally got her legal freedom when she was about 40 years old. But you found that exclamation mark, that document that places some, at least some clarity on it. Yeah, I found, I found it. Recently, too. I found it last summer. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but um, what what can you tell us about Harry? Well, Harry was enslaved at the Townsend home in Oyster Bay. When he was 16 years old, New York passed the Gradual Abolition Bill of 1799. That didn't mean that slavery ended in 1799. It meant that it was going to end 28 years later, if you can imagine that, in uh, 1827. So when he was 16, he had been looking towards that 21-year-old limit 
where then he could potentially become freed if his enslaver allowed it. But in 1799, they turned up the volume on young men. Now the age was 28. So he got seven more years added to his sentence. And Robert, as his legal enslaver, uh, managing his father's estate, I can see him giving Harry special gifts of money at Christmas and at New Year's. And when he turned 21, he resold Harry to another person in town, Jotham Weeks, who lived in Oyster Bay Cove. And he had a written agreement that time saying that Jotham must free Harry when he turns 24, which would be four years earlier than the law permitted. He must free him or else owe Robert $1,000, which at that time was a lot, lot of money. And so Robert tried to use his understanding of the law and his advocacy on behalf of enslaved people to give Harry a little bit earlier freedom and also to give him a clean record of ownership, which Robert could not give him, having stole him from Alexander Robertson. It may also be that Jotham Weeks was teaching him a skill too, which was another part of what you needed to become free. You had to have a way of making a living. Right. And and at one point, I think earlier you had a there was a like a filing fee. I don't think they called it back, but there was a fee that. So I mean, just the the legal hurdles they threw up just to try to emancipate someone. I mean, just imagine no one over fifty could be freed by law. No one uh, who was a child or a teen or even a young adult could be freed by law. No one with a disability could be freed by law, or anyone with an illness. And you had to prove not just that you could make some money, but that you could make enough money to be self-sufficient. You had to prove this to these overseers of the poor. And that was, that was how the law changed right after the war ended in 1785. Prior to that, almost no one was set free because you had to pay the town way more than the slave was worth. You had to pay the town 200 pounds plus losing the value of the slave. So yeah, that was a very onerous law that, that got changed, but it didn't make it that much easier. Just to pivot a little, we'll, we'll talk about, or I want to mention, this, so the middle grade version of this, the uh, Remember List, is out now, right? It's out now, but it's only available through the nonprofit. It's easy to remember how to get to us because it's rememberlist.org. That's our website. And I know you, you're, you're doing a lot of speaking, so I'm curious, as you speak with that age group, say from fourth to 11th grade, I think you go to, what, what do you find they react to in the story or, or what do you find engages them in this kind of history? They're so interested. Uh, some people think that young people are going to be upset or depressed if you teach them about the harshness of slavery in New York, but actually they're, they're quite open to understanding it. And I find that teens in high school uh, do get frustrated and upset, not by learning about lists, but by realizing that nobody taught them about this topic before. So I think that kids really are ready to hear about the extent of slavery and about this engaging story that includes all this espionage and invisible ink and secret codes. It gives them this historical context to hear Liz's story and to remember it. And they really do. They remember her and they're fascinated by all the details. Yeah. And, and to that point, we'll mention that the book I think uniquely has um, links to primary sources. Are those all in the New York State archives, or at least some of them are? This is so amazing. You know, my book for adults, Espionage and Enslavement, has a ton of footnotes, which is fine, but a footnote doesn't let you see the document. Remember, Liss has at the end of every chapter a QR code that will lead you to two, three, four, five primary documents, most of which no one has ever laid eyes on, they're all transcribed, and they have lesson plans built around them, and teachers can actually go in and make their own lesson plans if they choose. So this is all done through the New York Archives platform called Consider the Source, and they've set aside a whole piece of that platform just for Remember Lists. So I'm eternally grateful to them and just so excited because I don't know of another book that does this. It's really innovative. Yeah, and, and just your your detective story of piecing it together, and you know, going back to Pennypacker, how sources can be misread or misinterpreted or misused, even, you know, can hopefully inspire some future historians to 
look at the record themselves and see what other things they can find. And, you know, all of these documents are up for interpretation. And I, I invite everyone to go and look at them for themselves. And if they disagree with how I am interpreting them, maybe that very act of reinterpreting will excite their minds and their sense of curiosity. And then they will go out and find another person just as interesting as Liz and lift their story up for everyone to read. What, what is your reaction to turn Washington spies if, if you watch that on AMC? Now that I know so much about John Graves Simcoe, he is really a person of great honor and accomplishment. And what they did to that man's life in that show is criminal. Do you know that there may not have been an underground railroad in the era of the Civil War without John Graves Simcoe? He became the governor of Upper Canada after the war, and he put into law in the 1790s the first anti-slavery laws in Canada, and he had to personally push those laws through. They celebrate him with Simcoe Day in parts of Canada for ending slavery there. So portraying him as a villain is just crazy. The psychotic almost, yeah. Well, it's just another another aspect of the story that's going to have to be overturned, and, and was, no pun intended. And and a phrase I picked up somewhere along the line, it it complicates the narrative, which I think is a a good sign that, you know, making people think against their assumptions or or what history or Penny Packer has passed down to us. We can see that there's much more to it. And any final thoughts or anything I haven't asked you or anything that's coming up, anything you want to leave us with? Um, In our first book, Espionage and Enslavement in the Revolution, the foreword is written by Vanessa Williams. And that's because Vanessa Williams is really part of this project from a very personal point of view. Her father's family are African Americans who lived in Oyster Bay and who can trace their roots back to the era of slavery. So Vanessa Williams' ancestors lived in Oyster Bay at the same time when Liss was there. And so she wrote the foreword to that book, and she currently has the movie rights to that first book, Espionage and Enslavement. And so it's interesting to have a person of her incredible stature and all of her accomplishments and, and her fame out there promoting lists uh, in the greater world. We're, we're grateful to her for everything that she can do to get the story out. No, that's great. And we, we look forward to that hitting the screen. Whatever version it comes in, I'm sure it'll uh, engage people. Because just to see someone with, like you said, use the word agency, a, a woman who is plot, you know, getting through life, but actively trying to escape her situations and and with Robert helping at, at times it's again it it shows a much more human story than than sort of the the big gaps left in the the more popular culture uh, versions I think we need to stop saying founding fathers I think we can say founding figures and we can make room in the group shot for Liz she can fit into that group of founding figures and represent 20% of our population in New York whose stories have not been lifted up and not been understood. 